Yes, I guess we can start. So good morning again to all of you. Thank you for joining this webinar. This is the first webinar uh, that we have proposed in the context of the project. The webinars in general serve uh, for internal purposes um, to align uh, perhaps the assessment activities across the case studies, but also webinars are a very nice means of uh, dissemination, explaining to our stakeholders what we are uh, doing. So this is the first webinar, which uh, we agreed will be dedicated to economics of uh, flood risk management, uh, flood damage assessment. The webinar will last uh, for around half an hour, and then uh, uh, there will be time for um, targeted uh, questions. The rules, uh, perhaps, of the webinar are as follows. Uh, you might um, want to switch off your microphone when you are not asking the questions in order to avoid the echo or the noise, background noise from your rooms. Uh, otherwise, um, just remember to switch on the microphone when you want to ask questions. Um, you might interrupt me uh, when you need a better explanation of the topic. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. And uh, we are trying to register this webinar for the scope of uh, further dissemination or simply um, if somebody wants to go through the webinar, through the slide, um, there will be a registration internal purposes available. Right. So this is the outline of my presentation. First of all, and I will touch briefly on the scope and purpose of this webinar. I will introduce a little bit the cost of the project, especially to our stakeholders, not to project partners. I will speak about uh, flood risk in Europe. Um, the um, research and assessment we are conducting for European Environmental Agency and uh, other international bodies. And then I will include some uh, examples from Italy, especially from the regions where um, our pilot, uh, regional pilot studies are located. I will talk a little bit about European policies um, related to flood risk, especially the European Solidarity Fund, because it's um, another example for which the service uh, that will be provided by this project might be used already. And then I will um, go a little bit into the theory, explaining the differences between the structural damage and uh, production losses. Um, there is uh, quite uh, a large confusion also in the literature. I so we will try to uh, sort this out and um, show then on the examples, again in Italy, um, how the production losses uh, might be estimated and why they are important. So this webinar um, in the first place serves for Inter internal coordination of the activities carried out in this project in different pilot regions. Um, it also offers some initial faults and um, specification of the business product and services we are um, to develop within this project. And it will also give an overall uh, general overview about um, um, why flood risk is important in Europe. What uh, you can learn by following this webinar, so it, um, I will touch upon the importance of flood risk compared to other natural hazards. Um, I will explain why flood risk um, com compromises economic development and social cohesion. And um, then I will, you will uh, also learn about the terms used uh, related to the flood risk uh, uh, assessment and flood damage assessment, both in um, disaster risk uh, um, reduction communities and uh, climate change adaptation. And then we will look at uh, specific methodologies. So I will not go too much into the detail, but it gives you a, a nice overview. And then you will see application of those methodologies in specific cases. Cost Data Project is a pathfinder project of the uh, Climate Kick uh, uh, Knowledge and Innovation Community. It started on 1st of July and is 
going to last until December 2015. So within this project, there will be an uh, ample possibility to engage with the stakeholder, especially regional administration and regional agencies that are dealing with flood risk. The project is carried out by uh, four partners, and the coordinating entity is Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, CMCC. We have also ASTA um, from Italian side, University of Castle Competence Center for Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation, CLIMA, and Wroclaw Research Center. The main outcome of the project will be a specification of the business model. Uh, for the consultancy, the business model will refer to the assessment of economic impacts of climate change and possibly also economic impacts of climate change adaptation measures in, uh, at the regional level. And this is the main innovation um, that we aim at. We will show uh, why it is very important to show the impacts of extreme climate and weather-related events at the regional level um, that disturb also the trade patterns with other regions. Um, the um, extreme events have distributional effects. That means that somebody will, will gain and somebody will lose it. And this is exactly what can be captured uh, by the regionalized macroeconomic model and the service uh, that will be provided. Um, I included also a brief overview about how the project will be executed or implemented. Um, so we start with um, scoping of the service. Um, this goes throughout July. We will uh, screen the climate risk in our pilot regions and we will go into the depth about what is available, what is known about the extreme event risk um, in the regions. Then we will collect all available information about the partial impact, especially economic assessment of the partial impacts in selected sectors. All pilot regions are focusing on flood risk and agriculture. Why uh, the Emilia-Romagna pilot region will also include the coastal um, risk. Um, this is uh, simply for demonstration purpose. Um, it is expected that uh, um, the same service will be extended uh, to include also other services as a follow-up activities. Then the last phase of the project will concentrate how to translate um, the uh, modeling framework and uh, models developed or applied within this project into a business contract or business uh, um, service. The project will end with final conference. Uh, we agreed that uh, this final conference will, uh, will be held in Italy, in Bologna, in December after the um, conference of parties to UNFCCC uh, convention so in order to ensure that most of the relevant actors who are interested perhaps both in what's going on in Paris at the COP and as well as um, in application of um, regional climate adaptation strategies and plans might attend the final conference. Flood, is, a flood risk in Europe, uh, uh, the flood together with the windstorm is the costliest and deadliest hazard in Europe. Um, there are several estimates how much was lost in terms of structural um, damage uh, to floods, um, the estimates were done by a European Environmental Agency. Uh, it was estimated as for the period of 1998 uh, up to 2009 as uh, for more than 60 billion euros, uh, which is already an estimate that is deflated, accounted for inflation, um, and uh, partially also in comparable terms. That means um, uh, purchasing parity standards. The major floods, <clears throat> the major floods um, um, over a larger period, um, 1976 and 2006, uh, 76 and 2006, have um, caused even larger damage. And we have um, completed recently the update of these estimates uh, for the European Environmental Agency using the data that is collected and uh, produced by Munich Re, 
Munich uh, reinsurance company. I will show you some, some insight into that. So overall, um, the, the figures are a little bit uh, larger now and the flood risk um, account for a large proportion of the total losses to natural hazard. Uh, you might know that there were also in the climate change community several attempts to synthesize the knowledge about the extreme events. And one of the most important ones is SREX report. And it is, this is a special report of IPCC looking at the extreme events and the damage uh, caused. And um, uh, SREX report provides the, probably the up-to-date, most up-to-date um, knowledge about what we can expect, what, what has been observed in the past and uh, what we can expect to happen in the future. The IPCC assessment report 5 has slightly updated the figures um, produced by SREX, uh, but not substantially. I will show also the comparison of the main conclusion between the major reports. This is the insight of a study uh, recently completed for the European Environmental Agency. You can see the distribution of the deflated losses, uh, both insured and uninsured, over the period 1980 up to 2013. The losses are expressed in, in uh, 2013 euro value. And when you look also for uh, adjustment for wealth increase, because, of course, the damage uh, grows as the wealth which is put in the harm's way increases. Um, so you need also in the normalization um, exercises like this one account not only for the inflation but also for the wealth. So the figure is uh, slightly different. You can recognize that there are um, some signs of a trend, but it's not very easy to interpret the trend. So basically, we had uh, large losses uh, in uh, 1982, uh, 1990, then uh, 2000, 2002, and then 2013. Um, there is a very large number of uh, small events or small to medium size event that altogether account for a very small proportion of uh, of the total losses over the period. And there's only a small number of events, something like 100, 130 events, that account for more than 70% of the total damage. Right, that means that, means that uh, it's uh, any attempt to um, detect the trend over the, uh, over the time period, 1980-2013, uh, is very difficult exactly for this this um, um, non-unique distribution of the losses. So on the figure below, you can um, see the distribution of, uh, of the losses by type of the hazard. Um, so they are hydrological and uh, uh, meteorological hazard, uh, climatological uh, hazard, and um, I guess uh, what is more interesting for our purpose is um, to look at the flood losses. Again, the 2002, um, especially the Central European flood in uh, Germany, Czech Republic, and Austria, is uh, the largest single event, the costliest single event that caused um, the cumulative damage in 2013 euro value, something uh, more than 25 billion euros. Um, what we have done also in the, for European Environmental Agency, we try to uh, geolocalize the recorded losses. Um, we used every single descriptor that uh, um, documented uh, the place where the damage occurred, and the result of this is um, is on the map on the left side. Every point um, refers to one record in the Munich Re database. You see especially the Germany, North Italy have um, suffered under many, many um, disaster strikes. Then uh, what we do uh, right now, we uh, sort of um, um, aggregate the losses by NATS2 regions. NATS2 um, regions in many cases 
um, correspond to the administrative um, uh, division of the country, like in Italy. Um, NATS2 is uh, basically the regional level. In other countries, uh, it might not fit exactly the administrative split of the country, but it's uh, nevertheless a very important unit for recording um, climate or weather phenomena. And what we are doing uh, right now, we also include a sort of normalization of the economic damage uh, recorded by the flat extent or hazard extent um, of uh, every single year over this period. So in the previous figures I showed you losses normalized for inflation and uh, for wealth measured as uh, gross domestic product, GDP. We are trying also to include um, the hazard exposure of, uh, of the different regions using the simulated uh, flood extent for every year um, across um, all European countries. So this is also a, a data set that uh, can be used um, for cost adapt purposes. We can request that. Uh, we have already uh, the data from uh, Institute for Environmental Study in uh, Amsterdam, and we can extend perhaps uh, the permission to use the data also to the Cost Adapt project. Um, all the losses that are recorded in the international disaster databases or European um, disaster databases have some caveats. So, for example, only the structural damage is uh, recorded, so it does not correspond to the true social cost of natural hazard. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the events that are recorded in the publicly available disaster databases like MDAT disaster database do not include a comprehensive economic assessment. So this is a, a situation we have to cope with. The normalization, as I showed uh, in uh, over the past slide, is able to account for general economic trends or social demographic trends, but it's not able to enter into um, disaster risk uh, uh, reduction measures implemented over the period or um, risk governance introduced that have um, certainly influenced the entity of the disaster losses. Very briefly, what is um, uh, projected um, by the climate change community, what might happen as a result of um, human-induced climate change, uh, we expect that the annual flood-related economic losses in Europe uh, by the end of the century might increase by 7.7 .7 to 15 billion euros. So just for uh, comparing the annual expected losses due to floods now are estimated to um, roughly four to six billion years a year, uh, euros a year. So this is going to double or triple because of the climate change. Now if you looked into the IPCC um, as in report five, you might have come across the across the <laughs> yeah, so just also, I, I don't know, Stefano, it's uh, that the, the webinar is recorded and there is a uh, background noise on your side. Right, thank you. No. Um, so there is a, um, a table that, com that compare the evidence that is uh, um, synthesized by IPCC, compares the evidence about the extreme events, what we expect to happen in the future, across the most recent report, that is the Assessment Report 4, SREX Report, and Assessment Report 5. It's very interesting to look especially for the heavy precipitation events and the intensity frequency. Um, so you see the changes, the, and the black one are assessment report 5, the blue one is uh, SREX report, and the uh, assessment report 5 is uh, shown in red. So there's slightly changes in the overall confidence and likelihood of, uh, you know, of the main conclusions. 
So what is very clear is um, that the future projection over the 21st century goes into um, very likely that express a very good knowledge we have about uh, and very good confidence with with the knowledge um, that uh, confirms uh, what we can really expect in the future is uh, increased intensity of heavy precipitation events, even in the areas where the overall precipitation will decline. Why? Um, in terms of the past observation and especially the attribution of the observed trends um, to the human-induced climate change, there is rather medium confidence and the likelihood is more likely than not um, um, as, the, as the most recent, um, recent assessment. This is, of course, because of uh, patchy data in some areas and across Europe. This is global assessment, right? So patchy um, data across the globe uh, with respect to the extreme precipitation event and in many cases also uh, the lack of information about the real economic loss that occurred as a result of the extreme events. Then I will um, go through some interesting examples of flood risk assessment that also gives you an overview about um, what we do and how uh, the economic damage assessment is conducted in specific cases. I will focus especially on the Po River Basin District. Uh, it's the largest um, um, and economically most important river basin in Italy. And the Emilia Romagna, which is our pilot study, is, um, is here um, in the downstream part of the river basin. Part of it is excluded from the river basin, so the river basin capture only part of the Emilia Romagna region. But there is a, a new piece of uh, legislative proposal that um, intends to extend the area of the Po River Basin District also to cover the entire territory of Emilia Romagna, so that it will be a little bit larger. So it falls basically very nicely in um, with the scope of our project. Um, most recent case uh, we have analyzed in depth is the Sekia Levy break. Um, it's um, a tributary to the Po River and in January 2014, the last year, um, the uh, levy broke close to the uh, Comporta Bastilla municipalities. What you can see is the simulated um, um, flood uh, as a result of the dummy break, dam break, and the economic damage uh, we have estimated for for this um, for this event. So the standard um, way of addressing the uh, flood losses is basically to determine the flood extent and flood depth, sometimes also using additional characteristics like uh, flood speed or flood persistence. I will come back to that. But this is an example how, um, you know, of the modeling uh, that is necessary for estimating the economic damage. Another example is very interesting. Uh, what we we have carried out this assessment in the context of Enhance uh, project. Uh, Enhance is an FP7 project looking into um, low probability, high impact type of natural hazard. So in, in this region what we looked at was the flood risk increased as the result of the 2012 earthquake. So what you can see on the left side is the series of quakes that were recorded and in May 2012, the most important ones were uh, had the epicenter here and here. That was uh, roughly the uh, the magnitude of uh, 5.8 and 5.9 on Richter scale. So what happened is because this area is to some extent below the sea or or is um, depending on the artificial drainage of water because the area former wetlands that were uh, turned into agricultural land and developed land do not have a natural outlet, so the water basically stays over there. So the, the um, anthropic use of these territories are heavily dependent on um, the water drainage because uh, the 
drainage channel in some situation cannot discharge the water directly to the river, especially when the river um, level is higher than the altitude of the surrounding land. So what is needed is the water pumps. The water is pumped out of the channels and uh, discharged into the river. And the earthquake has destroyed exactly this uh, infrastructure that is critically important for discharging the water. Um, so the modeling or assessment uh, framework included uh, the characterization of the area. The, what you can see is a different channel, drainage channel systems uh, in the area. And um, this is a schematic representation of what happens. So we had uh, basically this part um, heavily affected and these uh, water pumps or other pieces of drainage infrastructure destroyed or out of the business. That increases the risk of the surrounding areas to flood and that prompted also the or interregional um, civil protection emergency plan um, just to set the rules how to deal with those situations. So basically in this situation when you are missing uh, the critically important drainage infrastructure you have somehow to employ or um, control flooding um, intervention that permits you perhaps to avoid large economic damage if the downstream um, small to medium um, size uh, towns are affected. So you try to avoid the damage to the urbanized area by letting the wood out in the uh, agriculture land. So this is, uh, uh, for example, the estimated extent of, uh, of the flood in the area. The whole um, assessment framework included um, in that um, climate, hydrologic, hydraulic modeling and uh, a very uh, comprehensive economic assessment. So this is a uh, nice case of the, what you would do typically in similar cases um, elsewhere. Now, uh, from the hazard assessment point of view, you have to determine the probability of uh, extreme precipitation event in the first place and uh, probability of, uh, of different um, volumes uh, conveyed by the drainage network. So that has been done. I will not enter into hydraulic um, analysis, but if you want to, we can look into that. What is usually uh, done for this purpose, it's um, I intensity duration frequency curves um, are determined for the area just to um, establish the return period of the probability for events with different intensity uh, to occur. These, um, um, these curves are translated into simulated uh, water flow in the channels. So this is our, uh, our assessment is based on very detailed um, digital elevation model obtained from a leader um, campaign. You can see this is the Sekia River and you can see the dikes are much higher than the surrounding land. It means when the river um, is full, it's uh, um, in the occasions of um, high water stages in the river, the river is basically flowing above the the sounding land which is used for agriculture or the urbanized area. We have um, very good um, past uh, climate um, data series uh, for this area and uh, we have also run the climate projection uh, for this area for uh, the climate scenarios RCP, representative uh, concentration pathways 4.5 uh, and 8.5 for different periods. You can see what is expected. This is the distribution, for example, of the uh, pre precipitation, cumulative precipitation of a three months period, uh, the baseline and um, how it will shift in the future in different periods. And uh, the same is uh, for uh, for the uh, other uh, longer periods. We have uh, very good um, um, data sets for assessing the vulnerabilities and uh, we have recent uh, uh, population census and um, census of the buildings. Uh, um, there is very detailed uh, data on the agriculture um, activities 
both at the statistical level, and that means for small units, aggregated um, figures about how much was produced in different places, uh, but also in the farm level. We have the data uh, at the farm level um, that help us to uh, estimate what is the influence of the climate variables on the yield and income of the farm. And we have, and this is a, a, a particular particularly useful for Italy, we have also an estimation of gross added value at a smaller units than elsewhere in Europe. So we, we have a, a so-called local market areas, which is uh, typically a collection of uh, five, six, seven municipalities. And for these small units, um, the statistical bureau or the economic accounting system in Italy is also able to determine what is the gross added value from productive sectors, um, from the uh, macro sectors, let's say, of the economy, which is very useful for our purposes. And we have used that as well to improve our model. So the typical application is uh, once you have determined the probability of different precipitation events, you uh, you feed this information into hydraulic analysis. For this specific purpose, we have used the storm water management model uh, for modeling the overall runoff component. And uh, we have simulated uh, the flood extent once the water volumes um, conveyed by the drainage network exceeds the uh, retention capacity of the drainage network. Um, so we have applied um, the Delta 3D model to establish the, the flooded area. And uh, this is the result of uh, hydrological, hydraulical uh, simulation for different return periods and for every, um, this is for baseline and this is uh, for simulated uh, drainage network disruption scenarios. And for every of those events, we have determined the economic damage, which is very useful uh, for the decision making at the regional or interregional level um, to uh, determine what should be done if a similar scenario occurs. So this is simply synthesis of, of the assessment. If you are more interested in learning more, about the modeling framework and also the result of this specific case study, there is a report available from the from us or uh, from the website of the project. Now, um, I will open a little bit of bracket and speak about why this is important to determine the exact or uh, reliable uh, damage caused by floods. First of all, the new um, civil protection, the community civil protection mechanism uh, oblige all EU member states to assess the uh, disaster risk in their own territories starting from December 2015 and then um, update this assessment every three years. Second, there is a European uh, flood management directive that also obliges the member states specifically for the flood to identify the areas that are prone to flood risk and um, that are um, that uh, identify the measures that uh, overall help to reduce the economic damage or the social hardship. The third very important point and uh, why we need that is um, the uh, solidarity um, between the EU member states. Um, over the past week we have um, heard uh, many talks about the solidarity, especially towards the Greece. Um, Greece found itself in a, um, a very difficult, tough economic situation, and the bailout program established at the European level is uh, also a part of the solidarity shown um, with respect to one of the EU member states. The EU solidarity fund that uh, I'm referring to is a different um, financial instrument is completely different, is disconnected from the economic or financial imbalances of the member states. This, is, um, this fund has been established in 2002 as a result of the Central European flood and it was really meant as a financial assistance to the public uh, bodies in the EU member states or the neighborhood countries. Um, in the aftermath of uh, serious and uh, you know, 
serious disaster strike with uh, permanent or percussive um, impact on the regional or national economy. The maps which I show you is um, on the left side um, changes of the GDP, real GDP across the NATS2 units over the period of uh, uh, 2008 and 2000, uh, 2002 and uh, 2011, you can see um, some regions are worse off economically compared to how they, um, what was their economic standing at the beginning of the period, 10 years ago. Um, and this is basically the result of the financial economic crisis. The same is shown also at the level of NATS3 in Italy that would uh, correspond to the provinces, um, provincial level. And this is simply a background. Um, so if you imagine the large entity of the natural disaster strikes in Europe, how they impact the regions, this comes on top of additional stresses economic or financial stresses of those regions. In many cases it's uh, simply um, in the face of the recent uh, crisis it's very difficult for the regions to cope with uh, economic damage. So for this purpose uh, the EU Solidarity Fund has been reformed and um, allows the regions, um, establishes also the regional threshold for which uh, for events uh, that might, uh, for which uh, the aid from the Solidarity Fund might be mobilized. That means, uh, for example, if there is a um, large regional disaster in Emilia Romagna, like uh, in 2012, the earthquake, if the total estimated damage exceeds the threshold set at the regional level, then the region itself can ask for financial assistance from the European Union. The financial assistance is to be spent on emergency, emergency um, measures, restoration of the infrastructure and so on. The law specified what is the eligible use of the financial assistance. But um, for example, um, for exactly for this um, disaster strike, earthquake, Emilia Romagna received 660 million euros from the European Solidarity Fund. But what is required is exactly um, to show that uh, the overall economic damage at the regional level exceeds the threshold, which you might uh, uh, especially write, uh, this is required in the structural damage, uh, but we expect that in the future this will be required also in, uh, in terms of the regional economy, that means in terms of GDP or gross added value in the affected regions. So this is a, a brief summary about the activation of the European Solidarity Fund for the regional cases. Um, the regions that have benefited from the aid over the period uh, since 2002 until May 2015 are shown in the map. Emilia Romagna um, is, uh, is not included in this map because the disaster in the case of earthquake 2012 qualified as major disaster. That means that solidarity aid was uh, provided for uh, for Italy, uh, not for not as uh, an example of the regional disaster. And again, you can see the overall entity of the damage. Uh, again, it normalized compared to the aid. The aid in many cases is a small proportion of the damage, it's roughly 2 to 4 percent, but it's still um, substantial. And then you can see also the most beneficiaries over the period, um, that um, Italy received the largest part um, so far, together with uh, Germany, um, the mobilization of European Solidarity Fund for these two countries exceeded 50 percent of all payoffs of the of the fund. And this is um, the reasons for which the um, mobil uh, Solidarity Fund was mobilized in terms of natural hazards. And you can see again the floods, uh, future first, um, it's large proportion. So this is uh, simply to highlight that the type of service we are developing as the climate adaptation service for the regional case can be applied directly to the European Solidarity Fund as well because it uh, captures exactly 
um, what is required at the, for the application for an um, assistant. Um, it requires the assessment of the uh, structural damage and possibly also the uh, medium to long term impact on the regional economy. Right, so coming a little bit to the technical matter of uh, flood damage assessment. I mentioned that several times. Um, they are methodologies that are focused on the determination of the structural damage, what has been destroyed directly by the by the disaster strike. And alternatively, it's the assessment of the production losses because you were not able to produce in a given economic accounting period. So you're losing um, um, part of your um, gross regional gross domestic product. That means that has implication for um, your public spending um, in terms of uh, growth and stability pact. It has implication also for the um, entity of the taxes, public money that you can uh, collect from the economic entities. So it's a very important um, as well. It's not only the structural damage which is important, it's also important to understand what is the implication of the disaster strike on the economy. So just going through it, the structural damage is typically assessed by using stage damage model. There are different models developed uh, um, in Europe in different member states, but it, what it basically does, it's uh, um, for different flood depth, in this case, flood depth, it establishes the entity of the damage. In this case, this is uh, uh, as a percentage point of the total maximum damage, but you might have also um, different uh, expression of the stage damage model. So that means uh, it shows um, the entity of the damage uh, for different land uses or different economic activity according to the flood depth. This model is very important. Um, so basically, you have the flooded area, you have land use, and you uh, you are able to approximate what is the structural damage expected in your area. The model is relatively simple. What is very important is uh, it's to calibrate the model um, to your economic circumstances. In Italy, we have done that based on the flood event we have uh, I, I spoke about earlier. So you need uh, simply to do an um, advanced statistical uh, calibration of the of the damage model according to what the damage that was recorded in the area and uh, and the um, uh, auxiliary information you have uh, that means so uh, that's the uh, land use very detailed land use um, the buildings uh, in the area and so on so this is very relatively simple um, can be applied once the damage model has been calibrated in your area. We have also um, used the approximated the uh, volume of economic activity affected by the flood. For this purpose we have um, simply produced a grid, uh, a grid data set of the gross value added in the area. So every cell represents a certain um, share of the added value for different sectors. This is overall, this is um, this is agriculture, and this is industry, and this is um, services. This was uh, uh, possible because of uh, the accounting system I spoke about in Italy. We have uh, gross added value brought down, quite down, uh, to the earth uh, for a very small administrative units. Uh, so this is uh, um, uh, our specialization of the gross added value is quite reliable because it um, bases on reliable data. Then in this case it's applied a similar way like the stage damage curves but it uh, shows the volume of the economic activity, annual economic activity that is impacted uh, by the disaster. So it's an intermediate stage between structural damage and the macroeconomic influences. Now what we have also done is uh, we have um, used a very advanced uh, modeling framework uh, starting with uh, climate simulation, hydrological simulation and then looking into how the production might be disturbed in the affected regions and estimating the impacts in terms of um, 
cross domestic product at the regional level. I'm this is a typical result of our simulation. This, is, this covers the uh, medium to long term period. Um, so different stages over the time as the climate change becomes more pronounced. 2000, 2000, 2000, uh, 2000 as baseline, 2020, 2050, 2080. And this is uh, annual expected loss due to flood as a percentage point of the regional gross domestic product, right? So you can see uh, basically the trend for um, Valle d'Aosta. This is the baseline scenario where the annual expected damage in terms of the regional gross domestic product is uh, rather small now. It's a 0.06%. It's going to increase up to, if you take into consideration also the um, uh, potential uncertainty, it might increase up to 0.1%. Um, this is one, right? Uh, this is one trend and you can see there is the increase of, uh, of uh, the con contribution, um, the, let's say the uh, share of the flood losses in uh, regional macroeconomic output. But what you can also see that there are different entities of the impacts. What you um, also can see that some regions, especially the southern Italian regions, have uh, a negative impact. That means a uh, well, negative uh, percentage point of the GDP. That means the GDP will grow as a result of the increased flood risk in other regions. So this is what I mentioned before, the flood risk or disaster risk has distributional effects. That means somebody gains, somebody loses. And the regions that will gain um, from, from increased risk are basically the regions that uh, might mobilize their resources to produce more goods and services for the disaster affected regions. So this is at the heart of the service we are proposing and that, that will be, uh, this is uh, the standardized methodology and service provision will be produced by this project exactly to show how the trade between different regions are impacted um, as a result of climate change. Not only for floods, but this is um, an example exactly on flood. We have uh, um, done also for a simulated flood event in Emilia-Romagna a comparison of different modeling framework because the macroeconomic impacts you can capture using the um, general equilibrium model. In, um, this is the most advanced and uh, very complex uh, macroeconomic model. Or you might approximate that using input-output models um, where you don't have the, um, the CG model available for your area. So what we have um, what we have done for different specification of uh, of the flood event and um, economic uh, substitutability across the region, we have um, simulated a flood event um, that corresponds roughly to a, a constellation that occurred in 1951. There was an, uh, on the Po River there was a dam break that impacted the left side of the river uh, basin. Now we have uh, looked into what would happen now if a similar dam break occurred on the right side and there are important cities like Ferrara that are directly affected. You can see it also here. So what, uh, what would happen if the flood occurred on the right side and we use this simulated event to perturbate um, the regional economies. This is a um, work in progress but uh, um, as you can see they are di different specification of the model, different partial result of the macroeconomic uh, impact model. And depending on how you set up the model, you can have the situation that the only region that loses and everybody gains, um, this is the one result of the model specification. But if you, you know, uh, bring the specification of the macroeconomic model uh, closer to the reality, you might also um, see the situation that, of course, the Emilia-Romagna suffers most of this impact, but they are Veneto and other neighborhood regions also loses in terms of GDP, although they are not directly affected by the simulated flood. 
why Lombardy uh, Piedmont might gain. So this is exactly the type of result we want to show and translate into climate adaptation service to show that it's not enough. Well, it's very important to make similar assessment at the regional level, but it's not enough to look at own regional impacts of climate change. A, a, a regional administration should look into also how the regional economy in Emilia-Romagna, for example, will be affected by climate change impacts that occur in the neighborhood regions. Because only in that way you capture the whole entity of the possible Im impact on the regional economy and only in that case you are able to design the appropriate climate adaptation measures. Right, so this is a little bit lengthy overview of uh, flood um, risk assessment in economic terms. What is relevant for the cost adapt project is uh, in the first phase in the scoping study to try to summarize the information about the flood risk profile in your region, what kind of information is available. Um, it's very useful to look into how the flood risk management uh, was implemented in your region and especially obtain the data about uh, flood risk prone areas identified in your region. Um, ideally, those flood risk uh, areas should be also accompanied by simulate or hydraulic simulation that show also the depth of the expected floods for different return periods. We can use those, um, that data, to estimate, um, approximate the annual expected damage. So this is very important for you to look at in your regions how the flood risk management has been implemented. Then you can look into what is available in, in terms of post-event assessment in your region, um, what is available, what is the magnitude of the losses, whether there was a specific study that uh, um, helped to localize the flood damage assessment model and so on. And uh, together Based on this information, we will try to determine the expected annual loss in your region. If this is not possible, um, then we can uh, fall back to the plan B and uh, estimate the same expected annual loss using the pan-European um, assessment studies that are available uh, from Jersey or from other entities. Uh, my webinar was a little bit longer than expected, sorry, I, I, I will try to improve that next time when we will um, talk about uh, other topics. Um, for the time being, thank you for your attention and please don't hesitate to ask questions if there was something that you would like to me to go more into depth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yaro. I think either my presentation was very clear or uh, there is still some time needed to digest the matter. Yeah, exactly. We should digest it. <laughs> there are mm -hmm. some questions, but um, I'm sure I will have some. Okay. I have one already, Ariana. Hi, Ariana. Hi. Sorry, I, I joined later because I had other calls, but uh, uh, one that does not entail the modeling in itself, but uh, just uh, thinking of something that you. You, I mean, you all mentioned last in the last call. You said that you were like uh, mainly focusing on flood risk, uh, which I understand even more now. Why? I mean, uh, like the the pie chart that you showed with 52% of uh, um, the like uh, solidarity fund spent on that. I mean, justifies to having chosen that mainly uh, for this pilot but you mentioned like flood risk as the main risk and agricultural sector as the main sector while here you showed um, also like um, charts and maps and like uh, indicators that were taking into account also productive activity services and so on um, which like from uh, which uh, it's a much 
more complete like uh, pictures. It's not just focusing on agriculture and loss due to the agricultural sector. So is this the the output that you are going to that you are pursuing in the project, or so or or just agriculture? Agriculture, as you said last time. They are two. Well, um, perhaps we'll, um, we look at agriculture from two different angles. From the perspective of the flat risk, um, agriculture is the usual and uh, very useful subject to reduce the um, flood losses and damage. Because if you have the possibility to divert the flood water that would uh, induce large economic damage in the towns or to the industrial um, sectors, so it's very useful to uh, to look into the strategies that help you to store the flood water on the agriculture land because the losses are relatively uh, small. So the, uh, trying to shift the flood damage from the industrialized or urbanized areas to the rural areas, it's a uh, promising uh, strategy for reducing uh, flood risk and flood damage. But the flood risk overall is um, uh, is uh, affecting basically all industries, all macroeconomic sectors. Not only agriculture is affecting also industry and services. So this is why we have chosen that first because it's the most important hazard type in Europe and second because its effect is transversal across the macroeconomic sectors. So we will uh, basically assess the flood risk in terms of industrial losses, industrial production losses, agricultural losses, and uh, also the uh, private losses, um, um, losses or damage to the tangible wealth of the households. Um, this is a special case in the cost of the project. Then we are focusing on agriculture but for different purposes, it's not only flood, but it's um, also the water shortage and uh, production losses that comes as a result of the changing temperature rather than precipitation. So we will look at agriculture basically in terms of um, change yields and income of the farms and uh, show the impact at the regional level, but the overall impact of agriculture in many of our regions will be rather confined, uh, rather small, something like less than one percentage point of GDP in the worst uh, scenarios. Uh, the flood risk, on the other hand, is covering uh, basically uh, a large proportion of the expected losses. Climate change, the increased intensity of the extreme precipitation event, increased um, river discharge, um, so that from the flood risk we expect uh, much larger uh, losses to the regional economy. So with few words, flood risk is transversal for all macroeconomic sectors. Agriculture is a special case at which we look both for flood risk but also water shortages and changing rainfall patterns and changing temperatures. Okay, clear. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Daro, this is Silvia. Ciao, I have Silvia. another question. Ciao. Uh, just to know if you think that uh, your methodology can be also um, improved in the future to address uh, also direct intangible damages, such as mm. uh, the impacts on the environment or on cultural heritage. Yes. yes, this okay. is a very nice question. Thank you, Sylvia. We are working on that. We are preparing a proposal for assessing the flood risk in terms of the damage caused to the cultural heritage. Um, there is, uh, it's very important also to capture the impacts in terms of ecosystem service provision, and we are also working on that area. What we agreed uh, for this scope, because uh, it's not uh, the scope of Cost Adapt project is not to advance the um, methodological issues, um, 
for which there is much more time needed and resources needed, what we agreed is to use all the um, economic estimates of the climate change impacts that are either obtainable or are already available and show the cumulative impact on the regional economy. So I, I, I completely agree that there are other impacts that need to be traced down. That means, that, for example, the health um, or social or well, well, um, psychological impact of the disasters and including floods is very, very important. But it will take a little bit more time also for this academic community to develop the methods and methodologies to make a reliable estimate. The current economic accounting system does not take into account those impacts and this is also a sort of, we need to work on that as well. So the GDP when you listen to the radio um, or when you look at the Eurostat website does not include the changes uh, in the provision of ecosystem services, does not include any component related to the health. Um, I agree it's important. For the time being, we are concentrating on the macroeconomic variables like gross added value, um, like uh, GDP at the regional scale, and using the impacts that can be monetized. The follow-up um, exercises, perhaps also under the climate kick, we can uh, work closely together with the OASIS and OASIS Plus projects look whether they have uh, already developed something that is very tangible and can be applied also in this Pathfinder project, but I doubt that. Um, we can also look into how we will proceed with, uh, with uh, the ideas uh, that were proposed for Cost Adapt after this project has ended, and that might be taking the form of live project or um, Horizon 2020 or something else. And, um, make a second round assessment that will also incorporate those impacts. Thank you, Jaro. All right. Um, the nice thing on webinar is um, it's meant for concentrated and uh, rather, you know, short-term presentation and explanation. So if there are no other questions, um, then I would like to thank you for attending that. We might uh, then uh, discuss uh, how to change the format of the webinar, whether the it has fulfilled your expectation, whether it gives you gave you the um, indication how to proceed also in the cost up and to what extent it was also helpful for our stakeholders from the regions. Next time please feel free to invite anybody from your regions or anybody from the climate kick or whoever. Those webinars are basically meant as the window of this project to the um, policy business or academic communities and we will be very happy to engage in using the webinars as a way of exchanging both for internal and external purposes. Then, thank you and uh, I, I understand there will be an uh, internal meeting um, among the partners only that will continue a little bit on the compilation of the data that uh, is necessary for uh, prepare. So for all other partners, thank you very much for attending this workshop, uh, this webinar, and look forward to uh, meeting you at next occasion. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Yaro. <laughs> thank you.